Hey, I'm Bill Garnier from Speed River Contracting, and in this episode of the SRC Toolbox Podcast, we talk to Matt LeBlanc from LeBlanc Roofing here in Guelph. Matt and I sit down and discuss a number of topics, including how to spot the signs you may need a new roof, why you need to clean your gutters, and when it makes sense for you to get a steel roof versus a shingled roof. And without further ado, let's talk to Matt. So what I wanted to do with all of this was kind of get a beginner's guide to roofs. Yep. Given that you're going to be doing my mom's roof, yep. <laughs> we could maybe talk about or use that as an example because I find there's a lot of information out there, but there isn't one place to get it and there isn't a place to take it in. And even as a contractor, yep. I know a lot about houses, yep. but the specifics of when you need a new roof, what are the maintenance keys to roofs? How much does it cost? How long does it take? Just the real nuts and bolts. Yeah. In a one place that's easy to find isn't really easy to get to. Yeah. So why don't we get started with what are the signs that I need a new roof? Okay. So generally speaking, um, you know, there's the, the easy ones where you have a windstorm or something comes along and, you know, you find shingles in your yard. So obviously there's something has gone wrong. Either your roof's old or some installation issues, but you're going to see bits and pieces of shingles either in your yard, you'll have a lot of granules and that kind of stuff in your eaves troughs. So you'll, you'll notice them in your downspouts. So you've got, you know, little granules, kind of like small gravel, the same color as your roof and uh, near your downspout or, or in your eaves troughs. And then how far along, because I know there's other ones that you think about the curling of the shingles. The one that really interested me, I mean, that's an obvious one. Once you see the shingles curl, it doesn't look like a roof should. Yeah. So that's probably your first telltale sign. The next one was finding moss on your roof. Yeah. So algae, the older shingles tend to have that issue where you just, it used to be one color and it looked fairly consistent across it. And then you'll get streaks. So if you have a lighter colored roof, you'll have a darker streak down in a couple of different spaces and it just kind of looks dirty. So that would be like an algae buildup, a minor algae buildup. So people that live in and amongst trees, kind of like you're buried in a forest kind of idea, uh, you tend to have a lot more algae buildup because of the trees and the, the, the leaves and stuff that can fall on the roof. You know, the newer shingles now have something that's supposed to help keep the algae from growing and from staying. Um, so that kind of staining or discoloration shouldn't be as apparent as it was, you know, from shingles 15 years ago. And what's the danger with the algae buildup? What's the risk for your roof with the algae? Just deteriorating the shingle faster than it should. You know, we rely on the sun to dry the roof off and to keep it from staying wet all the time. If you think about like Vancouver and, and, and British Columbia there, they have a lot of rain, you get a lot of algae, you get a lot of buildup and it just stays wet. It deteriorates your shingles really quickly, then it can get into your substrate, you know, start to rot out and deteriorate your, your plywood and your trusses and so on and so forth. Are there less common signs that you need a new roof that we run into? Because I know in Canada and Guelph in particular, it's not like, say, British Columbia. Are there things specific to our area or just random things that people don't know about that they should be looking out for? Well, like I said before, any kind of um, shingle debris that you're finding, you know, obviously that's, a, that's an easy sign. If you're having, you know, an odd leak here or there, sometimes, you know, you'll have a leak where uh, if a roof was done 15 years ago and ice and water shield was less common, um, ice and water shield, you know, protects the bottom edge of your roof to keep any ice damming ice like back up from actually getting into your to your plywood. Fifteen years ago, it wasn't commonplace as it is now. So you could have uh, an older roof that has that sort of an issue where ice damming comes up, backs up, and then you start to see water coming in through your soffits. You mentioned fifteen years ago being the marker for ice and water shield. How do I go about finding out how old my roof is if I've just bought a house? And I don't know how old it is. Is there a way for me to either assess the age or get someone to come and assess the age of my roof? It's a guessing game. Unless you've got the invoice from when the roof was done, there isn't really any way to tell aside from just knowing what a, what a roof should look like. There are different types of shingles that they don't make anymore. So that's another telltale. Like there's, there's a few different varieties that, I've, that we've seen in the past that we're still removing that have been there for 15 or 20 years, but they stopped making them 15 years ago. And that's just, uh, that's an obvious one. Uh, but in terms of what a, what a current roof, three-tab shingles just have a, a fairly short lifespan in general. 
I know what my mom did, and she's not a great example because she's a bit paranoid. Mm -hmm. She had you come and look at the roof and give an assessment, even though it's not in that bad a shape. Yep. Is that something a lot of people do? Is that a practice you think more sh people should be taking on? Or is it sort of wait till the water shows up and then we'll come and fix your roof? Uh, being proactive is a good thing. Absolutely a good idea. You don't want to be November, December and having your roof already leak and then having all the snow and everything come and being worried about having the, all that snow and ice buildup coming into your house and having drywall damage and potential mold and all that kind of stuff. So being proactive is absolutely a good idea. With your mom's roof, like from the road, it looks okay. It's still got its somewhat original color. But when you get up there, what you notice is that there, there's algae on it. It is a little bit green, a little bit discolored, um, and they're starting to shrink a little bit. And that's what you see with, um, with the architectural shingles versus the three-tab shingles. The architectural shingles, when they start to, to wear, they start to shrink. When you put a new roof on and you look at them, you don't really see where each individual shingle is because there isn't a gap like you would with the old three-tab shingles. So as those shingles age, they start to shrink a little bit, and you'll start to see those key lines. They're also a little bit more brittle. So they're not as flexible as they, as they once were. I will eventually need to do my roof in the near future. And you talked about 15 year shingles, architectural shingles, three tab shingles. What are the differences in the shingles and what's your recommendation with what people should go with? Three tab shingles are what I would consider a builder grade. And that's, you know, for a long time, they were kind of the standard practice and anybody that's owned a house in the last 15 years, has had three tab shingles on the roof again with architectural shingles and uh, being one of the newer products that people are starting to move towards. There used to be a huge gap in the price difference, you know, something like $10 a bundle. So it was just not as reasonable for people to put them on there. Three tab shingles, there isn't any situation where I recommend them. That's like I said, they're builder grade and in Guelph, they're getting away. I don't actually think that there's any builders in Guelph that are using the three tab shingles anymore. I know with re-roofing companies, I haven't seen any any new installations of three tabs at all. So I'd say that Guelph in general has moved towards the, uh, the architectural shingles entirely. So architectural shingles, there's no, there, like I said before, there's no key lines in them. They're all butt up tight together. So they kind of give you that faux cedar look, the standard for re-roofing and the standard for, for roofing around here. And on average, how long is that going to last you? Uh, most of the warranties are pretty consistent. So they give you like an upfront around 15 year warranty, but it's all prorated. So you can get either, you know, prorated to 40 years or prorated to 50 years. There are shingles that have, you know, they call them a lifetime warranty, which is like a 50 year warranty is what they call it. But then you're also purchasing into a uh, warranty through the, the manufacturer as well. What do people most commonly do? In terms of the warranties, there's not a lot of people that want to put the money into it. There's a lot of people that spend five years in a house, five to 10 years, short amount of time. So they're just looking at getting it fixed and looking new so that when they sell it, they don't have to negotiate with the, with the new buyers about the, the price of the roof or having the roof redone. All right. So you're telling me that I should get a warranty on the shingles that you will eventually put on my house? Yeah, you get the warranty and then that's transferable for one, for one homeowner as well, for the most part. And the, the length of the warranty, yep. you said 15 year yeah. up to 50 years. So it's prorated. So basically a 15 year uh, warranty is good for 15 years, 100% good. Every company has their own thing. Some don't cover disposal. Um, some don't cover, they cover the materials. The installation? Or, or some of them, yeah, there, I'm sure there's one that doesn't cover the installation. Uh, that's a big one. But the 15 years is usually the best coverage period. And then after that, obviously, it's less and less as you get towards your 40-year your mark. On average, how long does it take to re-roof a house? Depending on the size of your house. And obviously how many people you have working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that works. Right. Um, so generally, you know, you can get uh, your, your smaller average size house in Guelph, you know, it would be a day, day and a half, depending on uh, the weather and the circumstances. Obviously the steeper the roof is, the more it's going to, the longer it's going to take. But, you know, one or two days is generally, I would say, a good, uh, a good ballpark. But depending on your circumstances, like there's houses that are downtown Guelph that have no access you know, your houses are two or three feet apart, you know, and that, that creates some issues and makes things takes a little bit longer because you have to be careful about your neighbor's property and, and everything else. Like you don't want to break a window by accident by dropping a hammer or something down off of the, uh, off of the roof and through somebody's window, you know? <laughs> so given that roofs are different, circumstances are different, as you just talked about, if your houses are close together for access, 
very hard for you to give somebody an average roof price, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's a fairly widespread, but I would say generally that, you know, your average home, but we're talking about like an eight or 900 square foot home would be a small end home, uh, anywhere to, you know, a 4,500 square foot home. And obviously your pitches and access all have to do with it. But uh, generally, I would say that the uh, the ballpark would be, you know, starting at around $4,000 and going anywhere to, you know, we've done twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 roofs. But that's obviously the high end of it. So the average, I would say, would be between four and 8500 just for uh, your most common house size. I already feel better about doing my roof just on those numbers alone. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and something else, too, is that when you, you have people that, that purchase houses that uh, – either never purchased the house before or never had to pay for a roof. And we had a customer in, uh, in Kitchener that had just purchased this house and was really happy about it and needed a new roof and didn't realize that it had what we call a mansard wall around it. So rather than having brick or uh, siding on the second floor, it was a shingled roof. So, uh, you know, extreme pitch, it was like a, you know, wall, essentially a wall, but still technically a roof. Uh, and she didn't realize that the expense on that was going to be what it was. So when she was looking at a new roof, she was thinking, you know, $4,500 is not a big deal. Well, $4,500 for the very top of the roof, and then the mansard itself was twice that. Right, because so you got to get she... you got to get scaff to go around the house, and you got to keep moving it around with every section you're doing. That's, right. that's that's a lot of man hours. That's right. And so you, if you don't own scaffolding, then obviously you're renting scaffolding, and then you've got the the actual time and labor and everything else. So you go from $4,000 to, you know, $12,000, which makes a big difference. And especially for people that have never had to, to deal with that, you know, steep roofs have a price. They're absolutely more expensive. Yeah. And I think one of the things with scaffolding is the cost of the scaffolding isn't a lot. It's the man hours to erect it, yep. use it, take it down, move it, build it again. That's a lot of lost time or buried time in that that isn't actually shingling we're doing the work yep. up the ladder. Yep, it's all the prep work. When I talk to people for anything we're doing, I say the minute you're going up a ladder, you're doubling the time. At minimum, you're going up yep. double. So keep that in mind when we're quoting this in the difference and say what a regular cost is versus the cost that we're doing. We find with drywall, once people get past an eight foot ceiling, and they see the sticker price on the board and tape. They're like, what? <laughs> yeah, wait, why? I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, because uh, everybody's yeah. got to go up. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's not, it's not that simple. Well, I mean, it is simple. It's just not desirable from a cost standpoint. Yep, yeah, and it's the same thing with, with roofing. I've had, uh, you know, we, we do a fair amount of custom work as well, custom-built homes where people have, you know, a 12-12 pitch on a roof, which is a really steep roof, and they get a price on it, and they're like, how about eight twelve? <laughs> you know, and they drop the drop the pitch on it because it's it's more expensive when it's steeper like that. It's yeah. it's harder. It's more dangerous. It requires a little bit more uh, not materials, more uh, uh, tools for the job and stuff like that. That you know, it's all a part of it. God bless you, because I'm afraid of heights. I'm not getting up there. <laughs> well, it's Just, not for everybody, that's for sure. <laughs> no, like I've done roofs. I'm not so afraid yeah. of heights that I won't go up a ladder. Yeah. However, once I'm up there, hey, I got my heart beats a little faster. <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> my legs lock up a little bit. Yeah. So it's definitely something that people are paying for to not do themselves. Yep. Yeah. And I have that conversation with homeowners a lot where, you know, mid 40s and I, I've done roofs before. My dad made me go and do roofs before. And you know what? I'm happy to pay you to do my roof. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, we get, there's a fair amount of people we have that conversation with. <laughs> I'm glad I'm happy yeah. to pay for it. <laughs> you know, I'll hand the check over with a smile. Like, thank you. Yep, thank have a you. good day. <laughs> uh, there, what, are there other things that you run into that say a new homeowner is not going to think about when it comes to the roof? What about maintaining your roof? Uh, overall, there's not a whole lot of maintenance to be done with the roof. We talked about algae a little bit. So obviously, um, leaves and that kind of stuff can cause an issue. So removing the leaves, obviously, you've got your downspouts that need to be cleaned out as well. Like downspouts, but your eaves troughs and downspouts need to be cleaned out if you've got big trees lying around. I don't really do that. I should probably get on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm learning a lot from these interviews that I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. About how little I have actually done to maintain my house and all the things I should be doing. 
Yeah. Like I should probably change my furnace filter and get my tankless hot water system cleaned and yeah. cleans my eaves trough. <laughs> my to-do yeah. list just keeps getting bigger and bigger and none of them yeah. are the fun, cool stuff that I want to do. <laughs> it's all crappy maintenance that nobody sees. However, it does extend the life of your house. Your house is the biggest purchase you're going to make and you should probably take care of it because yeah. the cost, as I'm seeing with all these interviews that I'm doing, and not that I didn't know this already, but the costs are exorbitant. If you don't maintain your roof or take care of it or do something to extend the life of it, it's going to cost you more sooner than you expect. Yeah. If you want to get 15 years from it and you're only getting 12, well, now your cost, your unit cost per year has gone up. And, you know, a big part of that is the underlayment. So for the longest time, all we would ever use was tar paper. That was kind of the product that was was available. So, you know, you hit tar paper on the entire roof and then shingle over top of it. Um, you know, with my experience, the, the biggest issue that I have with tar paper, the example that I use with the problem with tar paper is that you put it out on your roof, it rains, the sun comes out the next day and dries it off. And you know what paper looks like when you get it wet. It just ends up to this wrinkly, bubbly, dry out thing. And tar paper tends to dry out. So after it's been on your roof for 15 years, there's not a whole lot there. It kind of disintegrates. Like you try to, it, it's nothing anymore. It really doesn't do all that much. And that's where the synthetic underlayments really come in and, and step up and take over uh, where the tar paper used to be. This stuff's just amazing. Like it's, you know, 95% waterproof if you put it on properly. So it's good for up to six months without any, uh, without any issues like that's what the warranties are for so when you do have these wind damage storms that come through and cause wind damage and blow off a shingle off your roof if it happens then you've got this underlayment there which is really really important and you know that's a really important step to as well like we don't um i don't even give it as an option anymore when i when i price roofs it's just what we price for you can't get a cheaper roof without the underlayment we give you the underlayment and you get the warranty Yep. It's always interesting to see the advancement sort of in the technology. Having been in the trades, you know, 15, 17 years now, what was done 10 years ago is not what we do now in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> we do a lot of showers and a waterproofing system we use in the shower now versus what we used 10 years ago yeah. is another world. And we're like you. We we don't give the option for them to change to something else. It's like, we're doing it on this product. It's yep. going to give the best result. Yep. If you would prefer not to, that's okay. It will just require you to hire somebody else other than us. And we don't get a lot of pushback on it. One of the things that when I was working for the home builder that came up was proper venting of your roof. Mm -hmm. How much of that affects older roofs? And can you explain a little bit about what that means, why that is a problem or a solution to your roof lasting a little bit longer? Well, the manufacturer warranty to start with, um, if you don't have adequate ventilation in your roof, then the uh, the manufacturer isn't going to co uh, isn't going to cover anything under warranty. So the idea is that um, all of the extra heat and all of the extra air that's in your attic is basically cooking your shingles. That's what the the manufacturers will say. I have seen specifically not a house that I shingled, but a house that I re-shingled in Kitchener again that had, um, it was eight years old and the entire neighborhood was built at the same time. It was a subdivision and they had one of the homeowners came back and said, I have no vents on my roof. My roof's cooked. You owe me a roof. So we got hired to come in and do that job. We went in, we cut in vents and we redid the, we redid the roof. But the, the wear on the, the shingles were almost exactly the same as the rest of the subdivision. Really? So there wasn't really all that much difference from what I could see. Now, the difference was on the plywood. Yeah. Under this, the underlay, that, that's where it really showed the difference. It was dry. It was not, not very happy underneath there. And wouldn't so you same. be risking building mold in your attic space if there's no venting? If you have a bathroom or a kitchen fan or something that's blowing moist air up into the ceiling, then absolutely yes. But generally, if you don't open that area up to anything, it should be, you know, you've got your, your seal from the inside keeping any of the moist air coming in. Right, right. Because now you're going to end up with the products you're talking about with a tighter building envelope. If you're using this underlay 
that's synthetic, it's suddenly going to make your attic space even tighter than say the paper that you were using in the past. Now the venting is even more important for the life of your shingles. You got it. And, and just the overall quality of your roof, not just the shingle, but the actual, like when people talk about the roof, you got to think about the trusses and you got to think about the plywood and you've got to think about everything that's within that roof. It's not necessarily just about the shingles. Right. And how often do you get into having to replace plywood with a roof, a re-roof job? A lot of it has to do with plywood clips. So you've got 16 or 18 on centers and they forget to put your plywood clips in. So you get that nice, we call them fish eyes. So you look up at it and you've got a space in between your joists. The other thing too is like three eighths plywood. It's fairly thin. It's not really uh fairly thin <laughs> it's like paper yeah it's dangerous you can fall through it if you're not careful it, and that goes back to the ice and water shield on the bottom edge as well if you didn't have ice and water shield down there and you have significant ice damming then there is absolutely um, a chance that you've had that where you've got to the bottom foot or the bottom six inches is entirely rotted out potentially your fascia board as well but generally speaking what we do the most is uh older houses that have uh planks that don't actually have plywood. Right. So where we're, you know, the planks have a good healthy gap between them and we want something solid to nail to. So we resheat the roof with, with plywood. And that's a good use for three eights. And so you're going right over the top of it. Yep. Yep. With these older houses, like, you know, they're built in the 1800s, early 1900s, and we're not going to pull the planks apart because that's kind of part of the structure of the roof. So we're just going for a, for basically something to nail to and three eighths plywood over top. And it's, it'll be a, a good, good uh, back for the, the shingles to be nailed onto. And you mentioned the dips in the roofs in doing a little bit of my research. That was another sign that you may need a new roof. Is that the plywood between your trusses or joists are sagging? Now that could be the age too. So because three eighths plywood is kind of uh, it, it is a very thin, sheathing to use and when you have your joist space so far apart you'd figure after 40 or 50 years that it's just gotten weak so basically you know when it comes around to probably your fourth third or fourth re-roof with three-eighths plywood then you'll be looking at having to replace more plywood than you had before and is there an era where there that three-eighths was used more often are there eras of roofs that you say this is going to be a problem like i find with houses built in the 80s that was a period where they were tinkering with the building code. So you're running into undersized floor joists, things that squeak, houses that in some occasions had 19.2 inches on center studs, <laughs> very weird things. Whereas if you're in the later 90s, the building code has started to standardize and you're starting to see better construction practices. Or is there an era like that for roofs? I think that they started using plywood somewhere in the 60s. And I pretty sure that they started off with three eighths plywood. So the house that we're in now was built in 74, I think, and it's plywood, you know, and, and, and it's been three eighths, three eighths is your building code. And I think that it still is uh, really? a lot of people. I think so. Yeah. With 16 inch on center or 18 inch on center and uh, with plywood clips, obviously. And we don't, I don't see anything thicker than that. Aside from OSB, um, OSB, they use the seven sixteenths. I think I seven think so, yeah. Yeah, 716 is OSB, and that's kind of the what's more common than plywood was. Um, obviously, OSB was much cheaper than plywood was for a little while. It's kind of getting pretty close. In Not anymore. Now. Yeah. <laughs> I literally, we were literally talking about this today, that at the local supplier at Rona, they told us that a 716 sheet of plywood is going to 50 bucks. <laughs> I need to change my estimate. <laughs> I just threw my hands in the air. I was like, well, here we go. What are you going to do? Is. Yep. is there anything that I have missed in our conversation? I think you had a pretty good, pretty good base. One thing that I, uh, I find fairly important is that, you know, we've had people where, you know, ice damming and stuff like that, where they've gone up there and tried to deal with it themselves and, you know, just, I always ask, you know, just if you have any questions, just call a roofer. Uh, I don't know about the other companies in town, but I don't charge if you call me and ask questions. You can send me emails. I'll happily answer emails. And if there's something that's leaking in your house, I'll gladly come out. Now, I don't charge unless we, unless I find something to fix, if I actually fix something. For the most part, I just go and assess the situation. It's a free estimate, right? Right. 
Um, but if you have any questions, if you need something done, you know, feel free to, to call and find a roofer to come out and, and take a look at it for you. Don't, don't try to investigate this stuff alone because ice damming, especially people get up there with the hammer and just start smashing stuff. And you know, you can damage your shingles. You can put a hole in your Valley. Like when it's cold and there's that much ice is the worst time to be doing any kind of roofing repairs. So do yourself a favor and just ask for professionals ask for help you know i'm laughing because only now having been in the trades this long yep i would have been that person yeah just like i would have hit it. i would have thought i was solving the problem <laughs> i'm gonna fix it myself now yeah. having been in the trades a lot when people tell me stuff they fix themselves i just say uh, you should not have yeah. done that that was a bad idea yeah. i i replumb my kitchen myself yeah have you done plumbing before no mm -hmm. Did you tell your home insurance company? No. Okay. Best problem. of luck. Well, I was listening to the interview you did with Keegan and about the water heater and the, the was that the suicide? Uh, the anode suicide, like the sacrificial anode <laughs> sacrificial, rod. Sacrificial, that's the one, yeah. He's like, you could do it yourself if you really wanted to. I'm like, oh, don't think so. I've never heard of it before. I'm probably going to get somebody else to do that one. <laughs> Totally. Kik is one of those guys who's he says it kind of in the vein of you could do it yourself. Yeah. Yep. I'm it's not just, gonna do that. Have you ever seen the t-shirt that says um it was $150 for me to do it, $250 for you to watch, $300 if you already started it? Yeah, I've I've heard those right. sayings before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep. it's it's an unfortunate <laughs> reality because renovations aren't cheap. Having a nope. professional comes out come out to do the work to make it proper oftentimes costs more than people think. And then you're in a scenario where, Hey, I want to save some money. I'm going to yeah. try this myself. And one of the things I'm learning with some of this stuff is the idea that can you afford to pay to do it twice? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did the one on, I did one on furnaces for with Adam Leroy from Highmark that's coming out this coming week. And he had some great stuff about how, he describes your furnace as the lungs of your home and you should probably take care of it. And I'd never, never heard anybody describe it like that. And I thought, Oh, that was amazing. And I instantly said, I should probably change my furnace filter. Yeah. I actually did that last week too. It didn't have anything to do with that interview. Obviously it's not out yet. No, no. Yeah. We just did the same thing last week. We're like, huh, we did a renovation. Did we change the furnace filter? The answer was no. <laughs> Dude, I probably hadn't changed it since Obama. <laughs> was president of the u.s <laughs> and i went out and i was like hmm, i should get some furnace filters yeah so yeah there's a ton of stuff and this is why i wanted to do it because so many people are buying a house now they can't get a home inspection because the housing market isn't allowing you to have conditions yep. so you're kind of entering into a situation a little bit blind and maybe not necessarily experienced in understanding how to maintain your house like I said before, it's the biggest purchase you're ever going to make. Having what's already there last as long as it can definitely is worth putting a little bit of effort into. Yep. Effort I have not put into my own house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's part of being in the trades, right? Yep. You do you work on everybody else's and unfortunately yours just has to wait. We're not going to look at pictures of other rooms in my house right now because <laughs> I am a prime example of that. One last question I wanted to ask you, and it has to do with when somebody calls you to get their roof done, yeah. what do you walk them through in the initial parts of the process between that phone call and the time that you will actually start? I always start with asking if they have any issues, um, if there's any concerns as to why they're calling for an estimate. Because, um, you know, like people have different reasons. Obviously, you found a piece of shingle in your yard. Or, um, you know, they're starting to fade out a little bit. And some people just don't like the color. So we always ask about what what's your initial reason for looking for a new roof? Um, uh, as after that, um, you know, I go through the products that we use, the underlayment that we're going to use and making sure they understand how important underlayment is and talk about warranties if they're interested. Um, and then we've always um, email estimates now that come along with information about, you know, cleanup and that kind of stuff. Colors always seem to be a big issue. Really? Picking colors, yeah. I would have never thought that. They're pretty 
basic generic colors for roofs. Like you don't have a lot of, you know, I mean, there's blue and red and green, which are hopefully being discontinued soon. But <laughs> aside from that, like everything's pretty earth tone. Like they're all blacks are a little, you know, they're not stark black. They're black or brown or gray or beige. Like they're all fairly earthy colors. Still, every house is a little bit different. It needs something that'll be, that'll help it look good. So you go through the itemized quote and then they accept or decline and then you schedule it in. Before you get started, do you talk to them again? Yes. Now we always keep, we try to keep in contact because, you know, part of what has made us successful is being, you know, we, we keep in contact. We like to people to feel like we were interested, that we care about the roof and that we're, we're there for them. So we always encourage phone calls. We always encourage emails. Like if you have any questions, any concerns prior to or after, like just give us, give us all the questions you have. We'll answer all the questions, even if it's not, you know, might not be the important, all that important, but it's still, you know, it's something on your mind. Ask, just shoot us an email. We'll answer it. We do similar because your schedule is always kind of moving. Yeah. And you especially because you have weather conditions, that kind of stuff yeah. that can change yeah. your schedule. So it's always important, I think, from our field. And one of the things that I find is lacking from what the clients tell us is that communication piece. Yeah. Well, and we, you know, we, we pride ourselves on it for sure. Um, you know, we, we don't just sign you up and then leave you hanging until whenever. Like, well, we give you updates. So essentially, we, when we have somebody sign with us, we give them a tentative date. Now we let them know it could be a week early, it could be a week late, but your date is, let's say, April 5th. So April, you know, we come up to two days before because we order the materials a couple of days beforehand on the third. And if we're not going to be there on the fifth, on the third, you'll know. We'll let you know that, you know, something's, you know, we've weather three days of rain, job took longer than it had to take, whatever the reasons might be. We give you the reason, let you know when our next tentative start date is. And then we, you know, a couple of days before that, we reach out again when we're, when we're starting to order materials and bins and stuff. Okay. My last question. Yep. Shingled roof, metal roof. Yep. Where are you in this? Obviously, as somebody who does shingled roofs, yep. you know more about that. Maybe you're a little biased towards that. <laughs> but I'm sure you get questions yep. about the difference. What do you tell people? Well, the big difference for me, um, obviously, is the cost. You know, there are some houses that you have that are uh, a family house, something that, you know, when you die, you're going to give to your kids. Um, and if that's one of the scenarios, then... That's probably going to be more and more normal. It, it very well could be. Absolutely. Uh, but that's where I give that scenario of, um, or, or a heritage house, uh, a house with very little access, you know, stuff like that, where that's a great example for a metal roof, just because it's going to cost a fortune to get anybody in there to do the work. And if you're going to do the work, you might as well do something that, you know, is supposed to be guaranteed for life. Now, Part of that is that even metal roofs have to have maintenance. Like nothing is guaranteed 100, you know, 100 years guaranteed without having some sort of maintenance to it. Um, a lot of the systems use exposed fasteners and the exposed fasteners have rubber on them and that rubber wears out, you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 years, something in that. Yeah. In that and eventually range. you're going to get water penetration because the gasket's gone and your water, your roof is seeing snow and ice and water on a regular basis. Exactly. So, you know, you're going to have those types of things that have to get done as well. And a lot of the times they're just installed over top of your old roof. So your old shingles and stuff. That's probably the most frequent installation that I see is you drive by and they're strapping the roof and they're putting the metal right over top. Yep. I don't know enough about that to critique it. So what I've, what I've noticed actually just in the last couple of years, I've been paying a little bit more attention to, uh, to the installation of these metal roofs. And the biggest one is that, when they do, I'm not going to name the companies, but anyways, when they're doing a new roof, they're putting ice and water shield down on the new section of the roof and putting the metal over top of it. But then the exact same house, so this is an addition, then on the new, the old part of the house is got strapping over top of shingles. No underlayment. So ice and water shield on itself is different than uh, like a regular synthetic underlayment. I just think about it from a structure standpoint, the more yeah. things you have between your strapping and the other structure, yeah. the more chance you have for things to move. Yeah. I mean, the strapping is is screwed and nailed fairly well. So the strapping isn't going to move. It's not going to go anywhere. But the structure itself, you're right. Adding the layers on top of it and all the weight on top of it is definitely not 
is another issue that I have with it. I look at it just from a sense of friction over time. As tight as it's going to be for the first three, four, five years, yep. like you said, the conditions, the roof attic is heating your shingles. They're going to deteriorate. As they yep. deteriorate, that bond through the shingles into the structure yep. is going to kind of create a little bit of movement. Does it concern me to the point that I know enough about it to say it's going to compromise your roof? No, but it's a question that I have. Yeah, the the biggest issue that I've seen is um, a couple additions and things that we've worked on where it's been a metal roof and, you know, expecting to find strapping and one layer of shingle and then two layer of shingle and then a layer of cedar. Now, Ontario Building Code is allowed for two layers, so you're allowed to have two layers of shingle, so a cedar and a layer of shingle, and then you've got to strip it off again. But then you've got these companies that are going in and just strapping it, not even paying attention to it. You've already got three layers, and then you add another layer of metal on top of it. Like that's that's an awful lot of weight load. So, on your roof, yeah, yeah. So my biggest issue with the metal roofs is just that, uh, just that they're being installed over top of shingles. Like it should always be stripped off. You should never go over top of it. You're not gonna. There is no reason to go over top of it. The labor is out there. The work's out there. The people that are willing to pay you to put the metal roof on there are willing to pay you to strip the old roof off. Right. Uh, the other the other thing too is that uh, I got an example across the street from us here that's got a metal roof. I think it's been there for about 15, 16 years, and it is not the same color that it was. It's got a real white, <laughs> hazy color over top of it now. Can you paint a metal roof? I would assume so. You can paint anything. Whether or not it looks good in five years is another question. Maybe we need a side um, business here, Matt, painting metal roofs. <laughs> painting metal roofs? We'll just get like a, a spray bomb. Like, you know the – the firefighters with the helicopters they yeah, scoop yeah, yeah. up the water and just drop it over top of the fire. Just do that. Yeah, that'll just work out great. Everything. <laughs> uh, I don't think that uh, everybody has a warranty. So I was just looking at one of the uh, ideal roofing. They sell metal metal roofing products, and their warranty is a forty year limited warranty. Now, there's a lot of stuff that they don't cover in that warranty, but they do cover for some types of paint fading. So they do account for it, but they have. I've never actually heard of the scale. There's a scale that they were um, talking about there. They're allowed a certain amount of discoloration yeah. before they consider it an issue. I mean, kind of halfway on the warranty thing. Like I think everything should have a warranty. Yeah. However, as I've gotten in this business longer and longer and been around longer and longer, you start to understand that sometimes those warranties are worded in a way that protect the company from ever having to exercise the warranty. Yep. So you're kind of going, what was the point of the warranty? that I'm paying extra for when it's protecting me, you from me and not me from the conditions outside. Well, that's where a relationship with the manufacturer comes into play. Um, that's part of the reason why we use the, the company that we do. We've got a good relationship with the sales team and we've had to deal with a couple of warranty claims that were extremely well dealt with and quick and prompt and the homeowner was happy and we're happy and the company's happy and, and it was good. So it really comes down to that. There are some companies that boast all these warranties and everything, but when it comes down to it, if you get into the nitty gritty, into the fine print of it, there's very few things that you're actually going to be covered for. Okay, Matt, I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks to Matt for taking the time to chat with us. Once again, I've learned something that my success as a contractor is not connected to my failure as a homeowner. So I need to go out and clean my gutters ASAP. I hope something in my conversation with Matt helps you understand your roof a bit better. And if so, please give us a like and a follow. If you're interested in more topics, check out our library of content on YouTube, iTunes, or wherever you take in your podcast. Take care and thanks for listening.